Well, now we are still considering this great statement which the Apostle makes in the 10th chapter of the Epistle to the Romans in verses 9 and 10, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart men believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth Confession is made unto salvation. We've called this the Apostle's description of saving faith. And we've already considered the content of saving faith. We are now considering what we are describing as the nature or the character of saving faith. We are compelled to do this because the Apostle makes this, puts this emphasis upon believing in the heart and confession with the mouth. We've seen that the heart means not merely the feelings and the sensibilities and the emotions. It means more. It means the center of personality. It includes the emotions and feeling, the affective part of man's character, but it includes more than that. The heart in the scripture stands for the very center and seat of personality. And uh, the point the apostle is making is that our belief must be with the heart, not only, not merely with the intellect. Now, that is the point we are dealing with and are trying to establish. And uh, what we did last Friday was to show that very clearly and plainly on the negative side, the scripture teaches that unbelief, likewise, is always a matter of the heart primarily, not of the intellect. You see, that is the way to approach this subject. Unbelief is not merely intellectual, though the modern intellectuals would have us believe that. We see that in saying that, they uh, not only deny the scripture, but they're even uh, not true to their own position. The very animus, the element of ridicule that comes into their writings and their speeches is proof that their trouble is still in the heart as it has always been. There is no advance on the statement in Psalm 14, verse 1, the fool hath said in his heart, there is no God. That's where the trouble really lies. And it's most important that you and I should realize that. It's very interesting to me to observe how what one tries to say like this is constantly being confirmed. I was reading a review of a book in in an evangelical weekly journal only this week. It wasn't last week's number. I... uh, saw three back numbers, so I won't tell you which of them it was. But I was reading the review of a book, and uh, this evangelical reviewer, obviously not grasping this point, uh, was uh, chiding uh, evangelicals because of our failure to meet uh, the modern intellectual skeptics and unbelievers on their own ground. He wasn't really defending the Bishop of Woolwich, but he came very near to doing so. Because we can't persuade the modern intellectuals of the truth of the gospel. The answer to that kind of thing is, of course, that the intellectuals have always been in that position. Not many wise men after the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called, says the Apostle Paul himself, the supreme evangelist. Even he couldn't, because it's not an intellectual matter. And the last thing we must ever do is in any way to try to change our message in order to accommodate these intellectual infidels. The trouble is in their hearts, and nothing but a new heart will ever enable them to believe. Of course, we must do all we can to put the truth plainly and clearly to them, and I suggest that we are doing that, and that this criticism of evangelicals isn't true. And thank God, there are intellectual, intelligent people who are being converted and who become Christians. Not because they're intelligent, but because the Holy Spirit has dealt with them, because God had chosen them. Now then, I trust that that negative aspect of it is plain and clear. Let's move on then uh, to the positive aspect, which is this. Belief, obviously, is primarily a matter of the heart and not of the intellect. Now, this is a very important matter, as I want to try to show you. There is nothing more dangerous to the soul, in a sense, than to think that belief of the truth is purely something for the mind and for the intellect. 
It includes that, as I'm going to show you. Indeed, I go further. It starts there. But what is wrong is that it should stop there. That's only a part of it. It's not the whole. Now, this, I say, is something which is of extreme importance. As some people can delude themselves that they're Christians because they live only on their feelings, others can be equally guilty of the same thing because of their purely intellectual attitude and condition. Now, I want to try to show you, even from history, the importance of emphasizing a matter like this. I, I believe it can be shown very clearly from church history that some of the greatest troubles which confront the church today and which have always confronted the church have been the result of failing to understand this very point we're dealing with. I'm one of those who holds the view that one of the greatest calamities that has ever happened to the Christian church was that which happened when the Emperor Constantine at the beginning of the 4th century, decided to become a Christian and brought in most of the Roman Empire with him. The Christian church has never been quite the same ever since. Now, how did that happen? Well, it happened really because of a failure to understand this point. It's not for us to express judgments on Constantine himself, but I think a great deal can be said for saying that his attitude towards it was entirely intellectual. That is why he compromised and led the leaders of the church to compromise so much in order to accommodate him and the people of the Roman Empire. It was more or less a political and an intellectual decision on his part. And the emperor having become a Christian, the Roman Empire became Christian. And the vast majority of the people in that empire became Christian also. It was merely a changing over from one point of view to another. It was a decision that they took. And as I say, in many ways, the Christian church is reaping the consequences of that still. That's where the whole notion of a state church came in. That's where the whole notion of a Christian country came in, or a Christian empire, which has led to such grievous confusion throughout the centuries. So there is one very important reason for considering. But then here's another one. The teaching of the Roman Catholic Church throughout the centuries, and still today, is in direct violation of this point that is made here by the Apostle. What is it? How does one become a Christian, according to Roman Catholic teaching? And the answer is this. You become a Christian by giving your assent to the doctrine of the Church. Now, that's not my opinion. That is their official teaching. A man who gives his assent to the doctrine of the church is a Christian. And merely to give your assent intellectually to the doctrine of the church is enough. If you say, I'm prepared to accept and to listen to the teaching of the church, you are immediately and of necessity a Christian. Indeed, they go further. They even say this, that believing the teaching of the church without actually knowing what it is is enough. In other words, if you say this, you say, well now, I don't understand. I haven't read much. I can't think very clearly. But I am prepared to trust my soul to the church. That's enough, they say. If you say that you're prepared to trust the church with your soul, even though you don't know what her teaching is, it's enough to save you. Because you are giving your assent to the church and her teaching, even though you are doing so in ignorance. Now, that is Roman Catholic teaching. You see, it puts it all in the realm of the intellect. There is no demand for experience at all. It is primarily an intellectual matter. Indeed, it is almost exclusively an intellectual matter. Now, that, you see, is the opposite of a teaching which says, with the heart men believeth unto righteousness. And a text which I've already quoted where Peter tells us, be ready at all times to give a reason for the hope that is in you, with meekness. So, as we face this whole question of the teaching of the Roman Catholic Church, and as we have been reminded in the newspapers this morning, 
that even though the complete union of Protestantism and Roman Catholicism will not take place in our lifetime, it is certain to happen. Well, then it's only right that we should know and prepare our children to realize what exactly we are committing ourselves to. That is the Roman Catholic position, and it always has been. Purely intellectual. So, you see, it's not surprising that they divide up Christians into the ordinary and the extraordinary. They divide up uh, the church into uh, the lay Christian and the uh, clergy, the separated Christian. The whole time Christian, as it were. The worldly Christian, the spiritual Christian. All their teaching really emanates from this. And you can be a worldly Christian and an ignorant Christian. It doesn't matter. As long as you say that you trust the church, all is well and you are saved. Now, that's the complete antithesis, as you see, of what we've got here. But now, unfortunately, this uh, is not confined to Roman Catholicism. This uh, false notion of uh, the character of saving faith has often afflicted the Protestant church. Now, there is one very notable example of it, which took place in the 18th century, uh, known as Sandymanianism. This was a teaching that began in Scotland, first taught by a man called John Glass, G-L-A-S, a very able man. Then a daughter of his married a man called Robert Sandyman. And Sandyman came down into England and propagated this teaching. So it's commonly known as Sandymanianism. The followers in Scotland were known as Glassites. But Sandymanianism has become the popular name for it. What is this teaching? Well, the teaching was this, quite deliberately, that if you accepted the teaching with your mind and were prepared to say so, that that was sufficient, even though you felt nothing at all. So they put their great emphasis upon, confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus. Though you felt nothing, though you were not aware of any change in yourself at all, if you accepted the teaching intellectually and were prepared to say so, that saved you in the absence of any feelings whatsoever. Now, this became quite a, an important movement, and it led to terrible results. It led in the Church of Scotland to a whole condition which was known as moderatism. Not that they were all followers of glass, but they more or less accepted his teaching without saying so. And the result was the church became entirely lifeless. And it rarely was not delivered from that condition until those great revivals took place under William Chalmers Burns and Robert Murray McChain and people like that in the 1830s and the beginning of the 1840s. The Church of Scotland, for almost a hundred years, was in a very powerless and lifeless condition very largely owing to this kind of barren intellectualism. And uh, there is a notable, uh, another notable illustration of this very point, which has always impressed me very much. There was a very great Baptist preacher in Wales in the first 40 years of the last century called Christmas Evans, one of the great preachers of all times. That man, for 15 years in his ministry, passed through a most barren, arid, and dry period. And it was entirely due to the fact that he had adopted this sandy Menian teaching. And he gives an account of how he was delivered from it. So you see, it is a very important matter. To be wrong on this point may rob a man of the gracious influences of the Holy Spirit. He can be correct in an intellectual manner, but he loses the life, the power, the joy, and the real thrill of the Christian life. It has been very devastating in its effect. But uh, we don't even stop at that. There are certain tendencies in this direction, even in our own day and generation. I'd already purposed to say this, before I read in the press last weekend or heard on the wireless of the passing of Professor C.S. Lewis. I regret to say this, but that was more or less his teaching also. He believed that you could reason yourself into the Christian faith. 
The first book he ever published was a book called The Pilgrim's Regress. And the whole point of that book is to say that by clear thinking, you can think yourself from a rationalist or an atheistical position into the Christian position. And he actually at one time founded in Oxford what he called the Socratic Club, which used to meet on Monday nights in which he used to try to show people how to reason themselves into Christianity. With the heart men believeth unto righteousness. You cannot do it merely by a process of intellectual reasoning. Another manifestation of this is what may be called believism, or if you prefer it, decisionism. The tendency to force people to a decision and to say, now, here it is, do you believe it? And if they say yes, you say, you're all right, you're saved. Or some coming forward at the end of a meeting. Now, I'm not here to say that that is of necessity and always wrong, but what is wrong is that a man believes that merely coming forward puts him right or that he is merely saying that he believes the truth, proves that he is a true believer, and that he has saving faith. The greater the pressure to make men take a decision, or to use a formula, especially if it is accompanied with some such remark as this, don't worry about your feelings. Don't worry if you don't feel anything at all. Are you prepared to say this? If you are, you're a Christian. Now that seems to me to be a complete denial of the teaching of the apostle at this point. If thou shalt confess with thy mouth and shalt believe in thine heart, for with the heart men believeth unto righteousness. The mere repetition of a formula doesn't save a man. He must believe it in his heart. So believism or fideism is again based upon the failure to understand this teaching. But let me complete my list by adding a final one. And perhaps... This is the one that ought to be emphasized most of all here on a Friday night. There is such a thing as mistaking a theological intellectualism for saving faith. What I mean by that is this. The danger of believing the doctrines of salvation instead of believing in the person and having a living faith in him. It is one thing to accept a body of doctrine with your mind. It is another thing to have a saving faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. You can be a perfectly orthodox theologian and yet have no spiritual life at all. That's not an exaggeration. It is a simple truth. I have known such men. It is a terrible danger. Theological intellectualism is as bad as sentimentalism. It's as bad as the Roman Catholic position. It is as bad as believism or decisionism. A man who thinks that merely an acceptance of a body of doctrine is saving faith is a man who is deluding himself. We are not saved by believing in doctrines. We are saved by believing in a person. You must know the truth about him, but you mustn't believe the truth about him without believing in him. You mustn't allow the doctrines to conceal the blessed person. He is the Savior. It is he who does the same. Very well. Now there you see are some of the reasons why it is so important for us to be clear on a matter like this. And not misunderstand the apostle's teaching here. He is not saying, as I pointed out last Friday, that the opposite to justification by works is simply an intellectual acceptance of propositions. That isn't what he's saying at all. He's very careful to point that out by putting this emphasis upon the heart. Very well, what he does here is what is done, I want to show you, everywhere else in the scripture. My dear friends, there's nothing more important than this. Our eternal salvation depends upon it. There is this terrible danger amongst us that having been brought up, some of us, in Christian homes and always gone to the Christian church of saying, but I've always believed this. You may mean by that I've always repeated the statement. Are you sure that you've got saving faith? I cannot expand the scriptures without preaching. It's a terrible thing to feed people's intellects at the expense of their souls. This is a most searching statement. So let me work it out for you in terms of the scripture. The fundamental proposition, therefore, must be this. That a change of heart and regeneration 
are absolutely essential to salvation. And there is no such thing as a saving faith without regeneration and a renewal of the heart. Now then, let me demonstrate this. The Apostle has already told us this. Even in this epistle to the Romans, Take the last verse, verse 29 of the second chapter. Or take 28 with it. He is not a Jew which is one outwardly, neither is that circumcision which is outward in the flesh. But he is a Jew which is one inwardly, and circumcision is that of the heart, in the spirit, and not in the letter, whose praise is not of men but God. He says that was the whole trouble with the old nation, that they never understood that circumcision is a matter of the heart and not merely of the flesh externally. And it's exactly the same now in the New Testament in the realm of faith. And then we've got another wonderful statement of all this in the 6th chapter in the 17th verse. But God be thanked, says the Apostle, that whereas you were once the servants of sin, you have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered you. Now there, you see, he puts the same emphasis. How careful he is. He doesn't say that whereas once you were the servants of sin, you are now believers in the Lord Jesus Christ. All right, but he, he wants to make so certain of this point, he says, instead of saying you're believers in the Lord Jesus Christ, he says you have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered you or that mold of doctrine into which you have been poured. As we saw, it really means when we were dealing with it. Well, now then, but let me give you some supporting evidence from elsewhere in the Scriptures. Take, for instance, that great statement in the 36th chapter of the book of the prophet Ezekiel, beginning at verse 25. Then will I sprinkle clean water upon you, and you shall be clean, from all your filthiness and from all your idols will I cleanse you. A new heart also will I give you. And a new spirit will I put within you. And I will take the, away the stony heart out of your flesh. And I will give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes. And ye shall keep my judgments and do them. A Christian is not merely a man who believes a formula. He's got a new heart. The stony heart has been taken out. He's got a heart of flesh, and the spirit of the living God is resident within him. There it is, a great controlling text in prophecy in the Old Testament, and it's but one of many others that I could quote to you. But let me come, let me bring you to the New Testament itself. Now there is a very interesting statement with regard to this very matter in uh, our Lord's teaching in the parables, and particularly that parable of the sir, which we read at the beginning. But I want to read you some of the verses in connection with that, as they're found in the Gospel according to St. Matthew, in chapter 13, beginning to read at verse 13. Therefore speak I to them in parables, because they seeing see not, and hearing they hear not, neither do they understand. And in them is fulfilled the prophecy of Isaiah, which said, By hearing ye shall hear, and shall not understand, and seeing ye shall see, and shall not perceive. For this people's heart is waxed gross. Or as John Wycliffe translated it, This people's heart has become enfattened. I rather like that. Waxed gross, too much fat about it. It's unfattened so that it can't function properly. That's their trouble. This people's heart is waxed gross and their ears are dull of hearing as the result of that. If your heart isn't working, none of your faculties will be able to work. You can't hear properly and their eyes, they have closed lest at any time they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears and should understand with their heart and should be converted and I should heal them. You notice our Lord's tremendous emphasis upon the condition of the heart. And he quotes that prophecy of Isaiah. You will find in the last chapter of the book of the Acts of the Apostles, Acts 28, verse 25 and following, the same quotation is made in exactly the same sort 
of context. But then when you come to the actual exposition of the meaning of the parable of the sower, the account of it in the Gospel according to St. Luke, which we read at the beginning, helps to bring out the meaning. You notice the 15th verse in the 8th chapter of the Gospel according to St. Luke, where we are told now about the fourth type of ground, the only one which rarely is of any value at all. Our Lord is here speaking a parable on this theme of saving faith. Some people seem to be saved, but they're not saved. They only last for a while. It springs up, you think it's wonderful. There's nothing there, there's no root. But there's one type which is right. But that on the good ground are they which in an honest and good heart, having heard the word, keep it and bring forth fruit with patience. You see, when he talks about having a root, he says it's in the heart. And if there isn't this root in the heart, it is ultimately of no value. It is a temporary faith, it is a temporary believing, but it isn't a saving faith. A most important statement. In, that is the whole point, as I say, of the parable of the sower. But then another very interesting sidelight on all this, if you only look at it from this standpoint, is the whole incident concerning Nicodemus coming to seek an interview with our Lord. John 3.3 3. Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Why did our Lord say that? Well, he said it, of course, for this reason, that he read the mind of Nicodemus. Nicodemus comes praising him and saying, Rabbi, we know that thou art a teacher come from God, for no man can do these miracles that thou doest except God be with him. Obviously, Nicodemus' attitude was this. That here is another teacher in the same line as himself, only that he's gone further. He's got more. And Nicodemus comes to find out what is it he's got to do in order to arrive at this new and higher position. Our Lord read his mind and he interrupted him. He said, look here, you've got to be born again. Born of the Spirit. You cannot advance by further understanding from where you are to where I am. I'm in a different realm and you must be born again. Regeneration is essential. Now there is nothing which so illustrates and confirms the teaching of Romans 10, 9 and 10 as just that very teaching on the absolute necessity of regeneration. You don't accept it merely with your mind. You've got to be born again. That's New Testament. And I am convinced that the main explanation of the state of the Christian church today is the neglect of the doctrine of regeneration. That's what's wrong. This is the fundamental thing. There is too much mere believism without regeneration. There is intellectualism without life. But the whole emphasis of the Lord's teaching is upon the absolute necessity of regeneration. And so you find him in John 5, 44, putting it like this. How can you believe which receive honor one of another and seek not the honor that cometh from God only? He doesn't say their trouble is in their minds or in their intellects. He says your trouble is in your hearts. You're proud. You're receiving honor one from another. You're paying compliments to one another. You're writing books to one another and reviewing one another's books. And it's all very wonderful. Uh, while you remain like that, he says, you're hopeless. Except ye be converted and become as little children, ye shall in no wise enter into the kingdom of heaven. While we are seeking honor from one from another, we cannot believe it's impossible. Well, here it is. It's his own teaching. But come along to the book of the Acts of the Apostles. And there you'll find all this put very plainly and explicitly and underlined. Look at Acts 2, 37. Here is the Apostle Peter preaching on the day of Pentecost in Jerusalem. And this is what I read. Now when they heard this, they were pricked in their heart. And said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? 
pricked in their hearts, not stimulated in their intellects. Pricked in their hearts. That's it. And so we read at the end of that uh, same uh, chapter that they were all in a condition of uh, praise and of rejoicing, praising God and having favor with all the people. That's a proof that what had happened to them had happened in the realm of their hearts. But then let's go on to the seventh chapter of the book of the Acts of the Apostles. This great statement made by the apostle, by, by Stephen, the evangelist. Stephen, preaching to these gainsaying Jewish authorities, these religious Jews who were antagonistic to Christianity. Look at verse 51. You stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears, you do always resist the Holy Ghost as your fathers did, so do ye. The trouble isn't in their minds. They're uncircumcised in their hearts. It's always the source of the trouble. But then you've got uh, further illustrations of this. You've got it in the... Um, Eighth chapter, the story, the famous story of Philip and the Ethiopian eunuch. Here you remember the scene. Philip expounds the scriptures to him, began at the same scripture and preached unto him Jesus. And as they went on their way, they came to a certain water. And the eunuch said, See, here is water. What doth hinder me to be baptized? Then in the 37th verse, and Philip said, if thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Now you notice, Philip wasn't so anxious to get a convert that he could go and report it, that he says, now if you're prepared to say this after me, yes, I'll baptize you. He says, all right, you say you believe, you want to be baptized, but if thou believest with all thine heart, that's apostolic Christianity, that is apostolic evangelism. He wanted to make sure that it was of the heart. The mere fact that the man asks to be baptized isn't enough. If thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. And then from his heart he makes the affirmation and he is baptized. But then take that most important statement which we read at the beginning in the 15th chapter. Now this is a very crucial statement. This whole dispute came up as to how one becomes a Christian. The very point that Paul is dealing with in this 10th chapter of the epistle to the Romans. These Judaizers, these Pharisees amongst the believers, they said these people must be circumcised, they must be put under the law. And Peter gets up and makes his great statement. Now the material words are these. Beginning uh, in the 8th verse, or even, well, no, men and brethren, he says in verse 7, you know how that a good while ago God made choice among us that the Gentiles by my mouth should hear the word of the gospel and believe. And God, observe, which knoweth the hearts, God which knoweth the hearts, bear them witness, giving them the Holy Ghost even as he did unto us, and put no difference between us and them, purifying their hearts by faith. And then in verse 11, we believe that through the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ we shall be saved even as they. Now, you notice the emphasis. God which knoweth the hearts. Is, this is all a reference, of course, to what happened at the house of Cornelius. Peter went there. He had that vision. And these men came from Joppa to ask him to go over and to preach in the house of Cornelius. And Peter preached. And while he was preaching, the Holy Ghost descended upon Cornelius and his household. And Peter was convinced by that, that these people were truly Christian, and therefore he baptized them. And he's now going over that, and this is how he puts it. He says, God knoweth the hearts. He means this. God would never have sent the Holy Spirit upon them if he had not known that they believed in their hearts. Because God knows the hearts. God doesn't merely go by what a man says. God doesn't merely go by intellectual belief and apprehension. God knows the state of a man's heart. God which knoweth the hearts. Bear them witness, 
giving them the Holy Ghost even as he did unto us. Then the ninth verse, a most interesting one. And put no difference between them and us, purifying their hearts by faith. Now, here is a most interesting statement, which it seems to me is almost invariably misunderstood. People say, ah, that's teaching about sanctification. And uh, that is teaching which says that sanctification is by faith that you don't do anything at all about it, you receive it by faith, purifying their hearts by faith. Doesn't it say so? Quite plain. Sanctification by faith. You don't strive, you don't do anything at all, you take it by faith. As you took your justification by faith, you take your sanctification by faith. It says so. Purifying their hearts by faith. I'm sorry that even J. Alexander isn't very clear at this point, though I recommended his book just now. He's not clear on it. But it seems to me that this is a complete misunderstanding. By the way, Alexander doesn't believe that teaching about taking it by faith. That isn't what he means at all. He says that, that it means that the whole of the Christian life, your sanctification included, is through this attitude of faith. And there, of course, he is right. But what I'm trying to show is that this ninth verse of 15th of Acts has got nothing whatsoever to do with sanctification. Why not? Well, because the subject the apostle's dealing with is not sanctification, it is salvation, justification. So that's why he sums it up in verse 11 by saying, we believe that through the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, we shall be saved even as they. He says there's only one way of salvation. Jew and Gentile are saved in exactly the same way. Why does he use this expression then, purifying their hearts by faith? For this reason. The whole trouble with the Gentiles was that their foolish hearts were darkened. That's what we saw last week. The trouble with every believer is that his heart is darkened and it therefore needs to be cleansed. And there's only one way, and that is by faith. Now, not in the sense of sanctification, but that he becomes a believer, that he has a believing heart. If you like, you can call this regeneration. And I wouldn't quarrel with you. But you mustn't call it sanctification. The apostle's not concerned about sanctification. The issue here is, how is a man saved? Can a man who's not been circumcised be saved? Can a man who doesn't go under the law and try to keep the law, can he be saved? That was the burn of contention. That was the issue. And Peter says, here's my proof. I was preaching in the household of Cornelius. Here they were, they were Gentiles. I preached the gospel... God sent the Holy Spirit upon them, proving that they had believed from the hearts. How were they able to believe from the hearts? God had worked in their hearts, purifying, taking away the stony heart of unbelief, giving them the new heart of flesh, giving them the possibility of believing with the heart. That's what is meant by purifying their hearts by faith. Nothing to do with sanctification. Still more important is to notice that the tense is the aorist. It's a single act. And what he says is, God dealt with them there and then and proved that he'd done it by sending the Holy Spirit down upon them. It's a most important statement. The heart of men has to be changed, has to be cleansed as it were, ceases to be profane, ceases to be Gentile and unbelieving, is made a heart of flesh, is made a believing heart. That's exactly what Peter is saying and no more. Well, it's a most important statement, but let me give you another one to confirm all this. Go on to the 16th chapter of Acts. The Apostle Paul comes to Europe, gets his vision at Troas, sees the men from Macedonia, obeys and crosses over and arrives at Philippi. Now, this is most important. Who was the first convert to Paul's preaching in Europe? The answer is Lydia. How was she converted? Listen. Acts 16.13 On the Sabbath we went out of the city by a riverside where prayer was wont to be made and we sat down and spake unto the women which resorted thither. And a certain woman named Lydia, a seller of purple of the city of Thyatira, Thyatira which worshipped God, heard us, whose heart the Lord opened that she attended unto the things which were spoken by Paul. That is saving faith. 
The heart is opened by the Lord. Our heart was purified by faith, and so she was enabled to believe. She became a believer. She ceased to be a Jewish proselyte, which she probably was, and became a believer, but it was as the result of her heart being opened by God, not an intellectual acceptance of the teaching. It was the heart that was opened, and therefore she believed. The apostle is always saying the same thing. 2 Corinthians 4, 6, God, which commanded the light to shine out of darkness, hath shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. But you notice where he shined? Not in the mind, in the heart. It includes the mind, but it's deeper. Hath shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Let me just complete this evidence before I close. Go to Hebrews chapter 3 and listen to verses 12 to 15. Take heed, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. But exhort one another daily while it is called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. Not a hard brain, but a hard heart is the trouble. For we are made partakers of Christ if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast unto the end, while it is said today, if you will hear his voice, Harden not your hearts as in the provocation. Perfectly plain and clear, isn't it? But let me take you to a final quotation in the first epistle of Peter, in the first chapter, and in verse... Well, let's start at verse 21. Who by him do believe in God that raised him up from the dead and gave him glory? that your faith and hope might be in God, seeing you have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the Spirit and to unfeigned love of the brethren, and so on. Now then, this is where I'm proving to you that my exposition of Acts 15.9 is correct. The same person, Peter, speaking in Acts 15.9, writing in 1 Peter 1.22. Now then, those of you who believe that Peter is teaching in Acts 15, 9, that sanctification is by faith only, because it says that God purified their hearts by faith. But here you see the same Peter dealing with exactly the same point of how a man believes. You believe in God that raised him up from the dead and gave him glory, that your faith and hope might be in God, seeing that you have purified your souls. It means heart in exactly the same way. You have purified your souls. Now, if you're literalists, and if you say, but after all, he says, God purified their heart, right? I reply, he says here, you have purified your heart. Which is it? You see, both are wrong. It's got nothing to do with sanctification in either place. What Peter is saying here, looking at it from the human standpoint, is this. He says, you have purified your souls, your hearts, in obeying the truth through the Spirit. The context is you believe in God through him and in doing so you've purified your hearts. You've become believers. It's another way of describing a believer. In other words, the belief is not merely in the mind, it is in the heart. Peter says exactly the same thing in Acts 15, 9 as he does in 1 Peter 1, 22. And what he's saying in both places is this, that it is only a faith that comes out of a new heart that is a saving faith. Very well. Our Lord had really said it all, hadn't he, in giving the great commandment, which is the first and the greatest commandment. The answer is, thou shalt love the Lord thy God, not merely believe in him, with all thy heart and soul and mind and strength. The whole being. You love God. Because as James tells us in the second chapter in verse 19, Thou believest that there is one God, thou doest right. The devils also believe and tremble. The devils believe in God, that isn't enough. We must be certain that it is from the heart. The devils believe and tremble. There is a hatred and an antagonism. The proof of saving faith is that it comes out of the heart. 
And so you love the Lord your God. And if there isn't an element of love in it, as I hope to show you next Friday night, it is not truly saving faith. Well, we've got to leave it at that for this time once more, but I've given you this scriptural evidence to establish beyond any doubt at all that saving faith is not merely a matter of the intellect, but must of necessity be essentially a matter of the heart. Let us pray. O oh Lord our God, we come again unto thee and we come to thank thee, O oh Lord. We thank thee for thy word. We thank thee for its instruction. We thank thee for the way in which it searches us. We are conscious, O oh Lord, that we need to be searched. We are aware of a subtle foe and antagonist who would persuade us that all is well and lull us into a carnal false security. We thank thee, therefore, that thy word comes to us and searches us and tries us and exhorts us to prove and to examine ourselves to see whether we be in the faith or not. O oh Lord, we thank thee for the character of saving faith. We thank thee that the truth is so great that it takes up the whole men. We thank thee that thy salvation is a perfect salvation, not content with saving us partly or in portions, but giving us a complete and an entire salvation. We thank thee for the depth of the truth, oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and the knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his ways. O oh Lord, receive our humble praise for so great a salvation, for so glorious a truth. Wilt thou not, O oh Lord, continue to work in us mightily by thy Spirit, deepening our faith and our understanding, enlarging our hearts, so that we may ever run freely in the way of thy commandments. Hear us, O oh Lord, as we come and offer unto thee this our praise, our worship and adoration in the name of thy dear Son. And now may the grace of our Lord and Saviour Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship and the communion of the Holy Spirit abide and continue with us now this night throughout the remainder of this our short and certain earthly life and pilgrimage and evermore. Amen. We do hope that you've been helped by the preaching of Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones. All of the sermons contained within the MLJ Trust audio library are now available for free download. You may share the sermons or broadcast them. However, because of international copyright, please be advised that we are asking first that these sermons never be offered for sale by a third party. And second, that these sermons will not be edited in any way for length or to use as audio clips. You can find our contact information on our website at mljtrust.org. That's mljtrust.org.